Amen. All right, Hebrews chapter number 2. Look with me at verse number 1. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. The Bible reads, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? Now, if you would have noticed there, verse number one actually began with the word therefore. Therefore. Now, therefore means consequently, or because of what I just told you, this. That is a, a layman's way of explaining what that means. So it means consequently. So when you have a chapter that begins with the word therefore, it is necessary to go back, to back up to the previous chapter and know the context of what we're talking about to understand where you're at here. Obviously, the, the chapter delineations, what is the word that I'm looking for right now? Delineation. Goodness sakes, not Sunday evening all over again, right? Delineations, uh, those, those demarcation points, they're not scripture. You know, obviously the King James Bible translators, they sat down and they wrote the titles of these. They broke down the verse numbers. You know, when, when, when Paul wrote the book of Hebrews and he wrote this epistle to them, you know, he didn't sit down and do verse number one and then write out verse number one. Verse number two and then write out verse number two. These were added later. So we always need to keep that in mind and that's very, very important. So back up to chapter number one and if you remember, the theme of the chapter was that Jesus is greater than. The Son of God, Jesus, is greater than the angels. So if we understand that theme of what the previous chapter was about, the fact that, one more time, the Son of God is greater than the angels, and we, we go into chapter number 2, then we're going to be able to understand these first few verses. So keep that in mind. Now that you understand that the Son of God is greater than the angels, it says this, Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed. Now, earnest means like serious, to take this very serious, and heed means to listen. Earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Now he's going to tell you why. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, so what he's saying, if the word that was spoken by angels, the commandments that were given by angels, if people disobeyed the words that came from those angels and then they were punished, now look at verse number 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Now watch this, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord. Now who's the Lord ta talking about there? He's talking about the Son of God. So what verses 1 through 3 are explaining is if... You know, the Son of God is greater than the angels. And those that would disobey the words of the angels would receive a just recompense of reward, a serious punishment. How shall we escape if we neglect the words that are spoken by the Son of God? You know, obviously, if He's greater than the angel, then His words are going to carry so much more weight. Therefore, the punishment is going to be so much sharper. So, see how you have to understand that chapter number 1 is explaining to you that the Son of God is greater than the angels. And that's why it was very important to understand that that context was actually explaining that the angels are not sons of God. Because then that makes no sense when you get into chapter number 2 when he's actually explaining because the Son of God is greater than the angels than this punishment. We better make sure that we take you know, earnest heed to the things which we have heard lest at any time we should let them slip. So we need to be very diligent about these words is what he is explaining. Now, uh, verse number 3, one more time, it says this, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation... Now watch this, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Uh, verse 4, and then I'm going to point out a couple of things about verses 3 and 4 at the same time. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to His own will. Now, in the introduction to the book of Hebrews, 
that sermon that I had preached a few weeks back, I went over a couple of things. Number one, I went over how Paul was the author. I gave some different points on proving that Paul was the author, but I also talked about how the book was written to the Hebrews. Now, here is actually a point that I didn't use to prove that the book was written to the Hebrews or to the Jews. Look at verse number 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard them. Now, confirmed mean, means that they actually heard it from the Lord and then there was a confirmation. In order to confirm something, obviously you have to know about it and then there's a confirmation afterwards. Think about this. Where did the Lord, who is the Lord? It's Jesus, right? Where did He go preach? Only in Israel. He didn't go anywhere but to the Jews. And then right after that, when Jesus was ascending into heaven, He gave specific instructions to His disciples to first start where? In Jerusalem. So notice what happened. Then they went to Jerusalem and what did they do? They confirmed the word that the Lord had preached. So the, the, the word of the Lord was preached to them and then it was confirmed by them that heard Him. So they actually heard the Lord preach. Who is the only person or group of people that could qualify to say that. It's the Jews. That's the only people that could say that they heard the Lord preach. Of course, Gentiles heard him, but the Gentiles that heard him were those that lived in the area of Jerusalem. He was very clear that, you know, he was only sent to the lost house, the, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So that was his mission during that period of time. So this is further proof that this letter is written to the Jews or written to the Hebrews. Not only that, um, it goes on to say in verse number 4, God also bearing them witness. So another thing, and I didn't point this out, proving that Paul is the author of this book, is I did talk about how, how he was not a part of the twelve in the fact that them preaching it, that the, the word of God that is, that it was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. So he wasn't a part of the twelve or the seventy, however many you want to include in this, whoever he's speaking about that was preaching the Word of God. But not only that, he wasn't a part of the original apostles that were sent out to do miracles. Because look at verse 4. It says, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. So notice how he excludes himself from that. The writer of the book of Hebrews. He said, God also bearing them witness. Talking about those that heard him right now. And those that heard him were then sent out afterwards. Now, Paul also was able to work miracles, but you got to be specific with the text. He's not talking about anyone that was sent out at any time. It's, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness. So, notice that it's specific to the group of those that God sent out, Jesus Christ that is, when he ascended into heaven. And th the writer does not put himself in that category. He says them. He excludes himself. So, another further proof that this is Paul, I believe. Now, it says there again... I know we've read it a few times, but there's a few things that I want to I point out here. It says, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles. And then it says this, and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Now we know when Jesus Christ ascended into, back into heaven, right before that, he gave them the Holy Ghost, right? He gave them the Holy Spirit and he allowed them to be able to work miracles. You know, this, is take, this takes place, uh, the greatest example is Mark 16, right? And, uh, you know, it talks about that they went about preaching, you know, and the, that the signs were meant to confirm the word. I want you to go with me to Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians chapter number 4. I want you to get your hand there and then we're going to go to an Old Testament passage because this is actually a fulfillment of prophecy. Ephesians chapter number 4, and then I want you to go to Jeremiah chapter number 3, verse number 15. Jeremiah chapter number 3, verse number 15. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter number 3, verse number 15 is actually a very, very famous uh, passage here. Look at Jeremiah chapter number 3, verse number 15. It says this, And I will give you pastors... He says this, according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. So notice he says, I will give you pastors according to mine heart. I want you to look at Ephesians chapter number 4. And I want you to look with me at verse number uh, 11, as I said. Verse number 10 is speaking about how, uh, verse number 9 and 10 is speaking of how he, he ascended and descended. 
Verse number 8 is actually pertinent right now. Look at verse 8 with me. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. And then it says this, and gave gifts unto men. Now notice it says that he gave gifts unto men. Now this is of course through the Holy Ghost. Verse number 9, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. Verse 11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers. Now if you compare this to 1 Corinthians, uh, you'll notice, I believe it's 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. You'll notice that all of these gifts that it's talking about, pastors, teachers, evangelists, these are all different, you know, it refers to them as offices or members of the church and they are allowed or, or able to do this, they are enabled to do this by the Holy Ghost. So what we're reading about right here, these gifts that he gave, where he was, he was capable of giving these gifts to his apostles because he had ascended and he had the Holy Spirit and he gave these gifts through the Holy Spirit. So when we look back over at Hebrews chapter number 1, it tells you, and gifts of the Holy Ghost, it's interesting because it goes on to say this, according to his own will. Now, one of those gifts of the Holy Ghost is a pastor. And he actually talked about that in the Old Testament as well, that he was going to give them pastors. And he specifically says, and I will give you pastors according to mine heart. Just like how Hebrews chapter number 1, or I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter number 2 verse number 4 says that through the Holy Ghost, he gave them gifts. And one of them we know from Ephesians 4 is a pastor. And he says it's according to his own will. Just like he says in the Old Testament, it's according to his own heart. So that's an interesting, uh, interesting parallel there. Lo look at verse number 5 now with me. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. So we can, we can uh, right now we can still see that that topic is still being brought up, the theme about the superiority of the Son of God in comparison to the angels. We're going to start shifting right now here in verse number 6. And he actually starts comparing uh, the angels to man. He's also at the same time simultaneously talking about Christ and how Christ became man. But he explains that man is actually lower than the angels. So if we were to look at this on a totem pole, if you will, you know, it's just man. You know, uh, obviously I'm not talking about the man Christ Jesus, just the nature of man and mankind. And then it would be angels. And then, of course, it is the Son of God. So I want you to look with me at verse number 6. It says this, But one in a certain place testified, saying, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Now I want you to go with me to Psalm chapter number 8, verse number 4. We're going to see this quotation. There's actually a few places where almost this exact quotation occurs. Psalm chapter number 8, verse number 4. We're going to try to go to these pretty quickly. I want to look at all three of them. Psalm chapter number 8, verse number 4 is where the direct quotation comes from. Psalm 8, verse 4 says, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. So that right there is actually the direct quotation from Hebrews chapter number 2 and it's verse 6 through technically verse 8 as well. A part of it is in verse 8 also in Hebrews chapter number 2. I want you to go to Psalm chapter number 144. Psalm chapter number 144 is a very similar statement. You'll find this in the book of Psalms. Very, very, uh, almost identical statements. Psalm chapter number 144 and verse number 3. <clears throat> it says, Lord, what is man that thou takest knowledge of him, or the son of man that thou makest account of him? Now go to Job chapter number 7. Job chapter number 7. Job chapter number 7. Look at verse number 17. <clears throat> Job chapter 7 verse 17 it says this, What is man that thou shouldest magnify him, 
and that thou shouldest set thine heart upon him. That's like being mindful of him, setting your heart upon him. Verse 18, and that thou shouldest visit him every morning and try him every moment. So it's interesting. I love when you can compare scripture with scripture and you can see almost identical statements even across the board from uh, different authors even. Here in the book of Job, we can see a very similar statement. Uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that these are very similar books as far as the, the literary style that they are uh, in the, the the poetry uh, section. I want you to go back with me to the Hebrews chapter number two now. Hebrews chapter number two. So right now he's discussing man and he's talking about the fact that man is a little lower than the angels. So it's interesting that he first used prophecies from the Old Testament. Just think of how much doctrine you can learn just from the Old Testament. He used pure and, and, and only prophecies from the Old Testament to prove that the Son of God is greater than the angels. Now he's giving you only prophecies from the Old Testament to prove that man is less than the angels. So he's creating, as I said, this totem pole because he's getting ready to prove a point. So now he's, we've established that man is less than the angels. And he's also simultaneously a secondary application when he quotes this passage from Psalms this passage is also prophetic about the Lord Jesus Christ being made man. And we'll see that. I want you to look right here. After he had quoted this about man, verse number 8, Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him, but now we see not yet all things put under under him. Now, this is almost verbatim quoted also in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 27 and 28. And who is it speaking about? Speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. So notice how there's a parallel or a secondary application here that is also simultaneously speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want you to look at the second or the next verse, verse number 9. And this is where it introduces Jesus now. He starts talking about the Son of God. It says this, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels. Now that was a direct quote from verse number 6 and also from Psalm. So notice that secondary application again. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. So he established the superiority of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, compared to the angels in chapter number 1. But right now he's actually explaining that when Christ took on his humanity, when he became completely and 100% a man in his human nature, if, you're just, if we're just purely looking at the fact that he became a man and he took that nature on himself, well, he made himself by doing so a little lower than the angels. He was humbling himself when he took on that nature, when he took on that flesh, because that nature is in itself. The nature itself is less than the angels. It is inferior to the angels. So what it's teaching right now is the humility of Christ, how Christ was willing to humble himself because he loves us. That's the whole purpose of this. It's talking about the fact how he expressed his love through the fact that he was willing to humble himself and be made a little lower even than the angels. Now, what was the reason why he was made lower than the angels? It tells you he was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. So we ask the question, why did Jesus Christ come? Why was he made a man? For the suffering of death. You also have in Mark chapter number 10 where Jesus says, you know, that the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, no, I'm sorry, to, be, to minister, but to be ministered unto, I'm sorry, I, I did quote it correct the first time. The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So he's teaching right there that the reason why he came to earth was to give his life a ransom for many. What was the reason why Jesus came to earth? It was for the suffering of death. That's why he came, so that he, so that he could die in the flesh, so that he could punish, take our punishment in the flesh. So it says, to go, go further, it says this, crowned with glory and honor. So notice afterward is when he receives that glory and honor. Crowned with glory and honor, it says, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. So it's by the grace of God, it says, that he came, that he should taste death for every man. This just obliterates any idea that anyone may have had in their idea of Calvinism. It says that he tasted death 
for every man. And they try to explain away every word that's like all inclusive. God like uses the word all. And they're like, well, all doesn't really mean all. And then God uses the word every. And I don't know if I've ever even heard them try to come up with, but I'm sure they would try to use the same argument. I mean, the point is clear. He tasted death for every man. Every single man that has ever lived, Jesus Christ died for them. And this is interesting too as well. And this is going to come into play. I'm going to reference this later. Notice that it said that he tasted death. Tasted death. You're going to need to know this in a few chapters later on in the book of Hebrews. He tasted death. Now, did he just, did he just try it or did he die? He died. So what does it mean when it says he tasted it? That doesn't mean that he just tried it and then he didn't you know, you know, uh, uh, actually fully do what's being spoken of. It means that he actually did it here. So tasted can mean that you actually completely took part of something. It doesn't mean that you just, you just, you know, just tasted it, but then you, you decided not to. Now keep that in mind, and we'll come back to that, and I'll refresh your mind you know, uh, later on when we get to that, that point. So it says that he tasted death for every man. Look at verse 10. For it became him. That means that it was necessary. That's what that means. It became him. It was necessary for him to do that. For whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So there Jesus Christ is obviously referred to as, you know, uh, it, it says, for it became him, and then it says, for whom are all things. That means that he's the purpose of everything. For whom are all things? You wonder, what is the purpose of life? Everything was created for him and for his good pleasure, the Bible says. Everything. And specifically, Jesus Christ. When you look up that quotation that I just quoted, it's about him that sitteth on the throne. Right? So notice here, what does it say that everything's created for? The Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is he that sits on the throne, of course. So he is the purpose of all things. Why was the world created? Why are we made? Why are we here? You know, people ask these, you know, deep philosophical questions. Well, the answer is for Jesus. That's why we're here. Everything was created for him and for his purposes. Then it says this. So it says, for whom are all things and by whom are all things. That's saying everything exists by him. So because of him, he was the cause of everything. He, he spoke the world into existence. He is the word of God. We know that he is the creator of all things. Then it goes further and says, In bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now go over to Hebrews chapter number 5, verse number 8, and we're going to read verses 9 as well, or verse 9 as well. We'll see a very similar statement here. So notice it said, To make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Hebrews chapter 5, look at verse uh, 8. It says this, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8. Though he were a son, <clears throat> yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Verse 9, And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So here he's called the author of eternal salvation. If we go back, he's called the captain of our salvation. So you'll notice that, the, a comparison back and forth. I'm going to touch on that when we get back in Hebrews chapter number 5. Also, we can see that he was made perfect. In both these passages, it's teaching that he was made perfect through sufferings. Now, let me ask you this. This is very interesting, and it, and it can prove things doctrinally. Hebrews chapter 2, in this context, what's it talking about that, G, that he did? What is it saying that he had to do? He had to become a man, right? Specifically, it's talking about that he had to become a man. Because it tells you there, For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Verse 11, For both he that sanctifieth, and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. What does that mean? It's talking about how he has this in common with us. The fact that he is flesh and blood. The fact that he is a man. Also, verse number 9, it tells us in the very beginning of that context, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels. What's that teaching? That he became a man. So in Hebrews chapter number 2, this is why it's important. Hebrews chapter number 2, it's in the context of saying that he became a man or him being a man is what he had to do in order to go through these sufferings, in order to be made perfect, right? Well, over in Hebrews chapter number 5, it says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience. You notice what's going on there is 
In Hebrews chapter 5, when it's speaking about him being a man, it just refers to him as a son. In Hebrews chapter number 2, it just says he was made a little lower than the angels. Now, what does it mean to be made a little lower than the angels? Well, verse number 6 told you that it was man, to be a man. That man was made a little lower than the angels. So what does it mean? It means that being a man, Jesus' humanity is the way in which he is the Son. So you could prove this over and over again. These are parallel verses. One says, through being a son, he suffered. One says, through being a man, he suffered. That's basically the point of these two verses. So you can see the consistency there of why Jesus, again, is called the Son of God is because he became a man, his flesh and blood. That's the context here. It's very clear. Look also at uh, verse number 11 now. We'll actually read that and, and exposit it. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. That's talking about that we share this humanity. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Now this is a quote from Psalm chapter number 22, verse number 22, which is a messianic psalm. And uh, one thing that you can learn from this, I'm sure everybody is aware of this, if you look up the passage, it actually uses the word congregation instead of the word church. So this is where we can get the definition of the word congregation or church, either one, and they are synonymous. Uh, whichever one that you were curious as to what it meant. Uh, you look it up, you look up this quotation, the Old Testament just says, uh, in the midst of the congregation, I will sing praise unto thee. So the word church means congregation. It's not a building, it's actually an assembly. It's the congregants here. This is the local New Testament church here, not here, right? It's all the believers that are gathered together. So here it says, saying. So this is saying that Christ said this. This is what Christ said. I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church while I sing praise unto thee. Now that's interesting because of course David is the one that authored that psalm. And that is a prophetic messianic psalm. But there's also another application of that. And that is of course uh, like 1 Peter chapter number 1 tells us that the Old Testament prophets were speaking by the Spirit of Christ. So what was actually in them was Christ. It was you know, the Lord Jesus Christ Spirit. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, they are one and the same. So that's how, when David was speaking these words, how it was Christ saying in the midst of the congregation in the Old Testament, that is, in the midst of the congregation will I sing praise unto thee. That's how that was Christ saying these words because it was Christ speaking through them, the Spirit of Christ speaking through them. If you wanted to look that, that up, that actually is from uh, 1 Peter chapter number 1. It's like verse maybe 10 or 11 or something like that. I don't have it written down, but it's, it's right around that. And you'll see it talks about how, you know, the Spirit that was in them and all of that, and the Spirit of Christ that was in them. Uh, look at verse number 12 now. <clears throat> Again, uh, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Verse 13, and again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. So notice, uh, uh, and I didn't point this out, verse number 12. It's interesting the fact that Christ refers to us as brethren. Isn't that an interesting thought? Because obviously we give him the highest regard and the highest reverence that can, you know, you could possibly give any being or any person. You know, he's the Lord Jesus Christ. But it says right there, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. So when he's, you know, in this case, when you think of the man Christ Jesus who is God in the flesh and he's speaking to the Father, he makes this statement prophetically that he is going to declare the name of the Father. He says, and then he's speaking about us unto my brethren. I mean, that's a humbling thought, the fact that he would humble himself and then he would look at, at all of his servants, all of his creation. You know, obviously he became, you know, uh, uh, um, you know uh, his brethren, among his brethren. But he would look at his creation and he would say, this is my brethren. You are my brethren. You know, uh, I, would almost, I would for sure, not almost, I would for sure even feel uncomfortable if he even said, hey, brother Tyler, you know. That would make me feel uncomfortable just because... You know, I can't even express to you what high regard that I hold the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, He's the creator of all. He's, you know, He is, you know, as the black Hebrew Israelites call Him, the most high, right? There is no one above Him. You know, so it, it's, it's, it's mind-blowing to think of the Lord Jesus Christ, the God of God and God of gods and King of kings, to look at 
all of us and say, these are my brethren. Yeah. This is my brethren here. But it just shows you how much he loves us and how much he cares for us and that relationship and how much, you know, how he truly became a man in a genuine way to where he can truly relate to us in the exact same way that, you know, that brother Anthony Bobbs relates to brother Hall, you know, in the sense of being brethren as can the Lord Jesus Christ relate to all of us. Think of it in that way. In the same exact way. The same exact way. I want you to look at uh, the end of... We'll read the whole verse 13 one more time. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. Now I want you to... This is, this is very simple to deduce. So this is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. And he says, the children which God hath given me. So... You know, he says that he's going to sing praise right, just prior to that. Now it says, and again, the children which God hath given me. That's speaking about us, obviously, right? So if that says that we are his children, then let's reverse the roles. What is he to us? Wow. He's our father. Amen. So right here, people read over this all the time, but it's another very clear verse. If I am his child, then that means that he is my father. You cannot be someone's child without being a father and a mother, and obviously he's not the mother. You know, so you know there are all these verses over and over again. They say, "Oh, there's just the one." This is just as strong. It says that we are His children, and the children that it says that God has given Him. It says that we are His children. Therefore, the only answer there is that He is our Father, which is why we will call Him the Everlasting Father because we are His children. Uh, all right, uh, look at verse number 14 now. It says this, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. So there's two words that I really like in this verse. Because it again expresses how this was genuine. And this was completely authentic, the fact that he became flesh. Number one, it says, for as much. For as much. So the same amount in which, or the same way in which I am a man, he also was a man. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, watch this, he also himself likewise took part of the same. So, however much you're a man, that's how much he became a man. That's the point of that verse. For as much then, or in the way, or however much that you, that's speaking about, then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, so however much that you are a partaker of flesh and blood, he also, in the same way, likewise, took part of the same. He wasn't going through the motions. The same exact way that you were born and became and was born on this earth, and obviously you didn't become a man, right? But the same way in which you were born and you are flesh and blood, he became flesh and blood in the exact same way. In a very legitimate, sincere way. He was fully and completely a man in a real way, in an authentic way. He didn't go through the motions. The other point that I want to make from this is that he took on this. He, was, he actually took part in this. Look at what it says next, though. I'll get to that in just a moment. It says, He also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. So again, the purpose why Jesus Christ became flesh was so that he could die, that through death he might destroy him, it says, that had the power of death, that is the devil. So that's an interesting statement about Satan, about the devil, isn't it? It says that the devil has the power of death. That, that he has the power of death. And why is that? Well, what, what is, you know, what, what did, uh, you know, the very first time the devil appeared, what did he do? You know, this is what he's, he's most known for. Of course, he came as the serpent and he tempted Adam and Eve. He tempted Eve and then, and then Adam, of course, just went along with Eve. And they sinned. And then what happened as a result of that? Consequently, they died. You know, the Bible says, you know, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And when sin hath conceived, it bringeth forth death. So that's how the devil has the power of death. Because he is the one that, he was the one that tempted them. He came and he was the one that manipulated and controlled the situation with, for all of mankind. So he had that power. He came and he tempted them, caused them to sin, and by doing so, caused them to die. Uh, go with me. To, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. We'll see this uh, spoken of as well. 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, 
First Corinthians chapter number 15. It says this, look at verse number 54. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Then it says this, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? And then it goes on and says this, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. So notice it, how it's worded there. It says the sting of death is sin. So you think about what is the power of death. Well, it sounds like there the sting is what's referring to the power, doesn't it? So when it's speaking about the power of death, it's the fact that Satan had that ability to get them to do what? To sin. He was there and came and caused them and tempted them. That's why he's called the tempter. That's what he's characterized as. He came, he caused them to sin, and therefore, you know, uh, had the power of death. The power of death is, is be, having the ability to be able to get them to sin. Because then they will die. And he came and it says, and destroyed him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to to bondage. Now deliver there is, you know, the Old Testament word it's used oftentimes for the word saved. So it's saying that he saved them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So let's speak about the fear of death. Every person w was or, and still is to some degree afraid of death. Everyone. Everyone. You may have more hope now than you did before, but you still have the same flesh. Right? So what will happen sometimes is you'll go through life and you won't have fear for a while. When you're strong in your faith and everything and you're walking with the Lord, but you'll again have those thoughts of death again and you'll have the fear of death. There's no, there's no one that just went through life and was never afraid of death. Never. It doesn't exist. The Bible says this, And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. That's, that, that's everyone. And not only that, all their lifetime. Now obviously, the closer you get, I would assume you probably think about it more and more and more, right? You know, that's the first thing I thought about when I turned 30. I'm getting closer to the end of my life. Isn't that what you think about when you have birthdays, especially big milestone birthdays? You know, you're just thinking about, I'm going to die one day. Death is coming. My life on this earth is going to be over eventually. There will be a day and a second when I die, when I pass away. Have you ever thought those thoughts before? There will be an actual moment when you take your last breath. On an actual date... In time and in history. You will die one day. You know? But you know, the good news is that we have been delivered from that. Amen. And in Christ, we can put those fears aside. You know, and we can, we can put all of our faith in Him and understand that He delivered us from death. He came and He delivered us from death. He defeated death. He was victorious and when we die, we don't have to worry about a punishment. We don't have to worry about you know, uh, whether or not we're going to stand before God and be guilty and be found guilty. We know that when we die, that Christ is our brother, if you will. Christ is our Lord. And He already paid our punishment for us. Amen. So one of the worst things about death is the fear of death. And isn't it great, and aren't you grateful, that we have reasons not to fear death at all, period. Amen. You can think like, hey, yeah, I'm going to breathe my last breath. And when I breathe my last breath, I'm going to open my eyes in heaven. Amen. Looking at my Savior and the one who actually delivered me, seated in glory in heaven. I mean, isn't that an amazing thought? And that's how He delivered you. And so, being delivered, it can also deliver you from that fear. It can also, you can also subside that fear when you have the hope in Christ that after death, the physical death that, that is... We'll go to heaven and be with Him. We'll be going to paradise. We have nothing to worry about. Things will be so much greater in heaven. Look at what it says next in verse number 16. This is very important. For verily He took not on Him the nature of angels, but He took on Him the seed of Abraham. Now, this is very important. I explained this before when we kind of got off of it for a few minutes because it was a little bit parenthetic. It was talking about stuff about Jesus. But what's the totem pole? It's man, angels, son of God, right? Man, angels, son of God. Now, notice it's telling you that he didn't take on him the nature of angels. 
But he took on him the nature of, or the, it says specifically, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Now that's telling you specifically that he came in the, in the flesh as a Jew of the line of Abraham. He was, of course, born of the line of Abraham and of the line of David. Now, it's very specific there, but the point was that he came as a man. It says he didn't come as an angel. He didn't take on him the nature of an angel. He took on him the nature of man, or of specifically the seed of Abraham. Why is it explaining that? It's speaking about how, how much he humbled himself. He made himself even lower than the angels. It's talking about how he loves us and how he was willing to, to make this sacrifice for us. And that this, this wasn't him just stepping down just to the angels. No, he actually took on him the nature of man. Verse number 17. Wherefore in all things it behoved him, that means it was necessary, to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Now I want to hit on something here that I kind of paused a moment ago. Now this is repeated and this is super strong. So in, in Hebrews chapter number 1, we could see that it was taught repeatedly of how the Son of God wasn't begotten as the Son in eternity past, but rather there was a day. This day have I begotten thee. There was a time in which in human history in which he was made flesh. He was actually made the Son of God. We saw that in Hebrews chapter number 1. You can see that in a few different ways you can prove that. I'm not going to re-preach all that because we have some information right here that teaches the same exact thing. So here in Hebrews chapter number 2, it hits on the same exact thing again. We can learn that also again. That there was a time when he became the Son of God. There was a time when he became flesh or became man. Now it is, it, it, it really is you know, people wear this out and sometimes they say this when it shouldn't be said, just when they want to mock a point. So Brother Hall and I have talked about this before. You want to just, you just want to totally dismiss something, something that is credible and something that is a good point. Sometimes people will begin by saying, you know, I don't even know why I'm bringing this up. Well, this is the truth about the person that says this all the time, Stephen Anderson. It is so ridiculous. It is so ridiculous, the claim that Jesus Christ has always been in the flesh. Now, I, I'm, I don't know how familiar you are with what everyone believes about the Trinity. But I, I have like four clips that I'm yet to release. And I don't know if I've talked to anybody about this. Where I've been looking around and uh, when I've just been watching stuff about the Trinity, people preaching things about the, the Trinity and things like that, just random you know, preachers, like pretty high profile preachers, where they're asked the questions about whether Jesus Christ has always been in the flesh. No one believes that Jesus has always had a flesh and blood or flesh and bone, I guess they would say, body. No one believes that. That is utter ridiculousness. Steven Anderson is the only person that I have ever heard say that. And I challenge anyone. You could probably find another whack job out there just like him. But I would be extremely surprised if you found anyone. Maybe he's getting it from somebody. But that isn't even taught by, by, any, by even Catholic, Trinitarians, Orthodox, as Orthodox as you can possibly be. No one believes that Jesus has always had a flesh body and was always actually a man. No one believes that Jesus has always had humanity. No one. Because the Bible cannot be any clearer that there was a time in which he became a man. There was a time in which he became flesh. The Bible says... The Word was made flesh. Amen. What does that mean? There was a time when it was made flesh. That means it wasn't flesh prior to that. And God did something to cause that to happen. Now what does the word made mean? Right? You're causing something to take place that wasn't prior, that wasn't going on previously. It was made flesh. God intervened, right? And in this case, it was when He caused Mary to conceive and the Word was made flesh. Flesh. It was made flesh. Look at the exact same language over and over and over again. And I realize that this is a dead horse, but this is extremely important. Amen. It's super important. The, the truths about the Trinity, and, and here's the thing. It's so important also because of this. Because there are so many people that are scared to talk about the Trinity too. So many people are afraid... They don't want to come in on this side. They don't want to come in on this side. They don't want to talk about any of it. They don't want to talk about the Son of God. How is the Son of God? Let me just leave it at this. They, those kind of statements, 
I'll just tell you that. Well, this is my opinion. Everything's a mystery. They want to take a hard stance. Study the Bible and find out what the Bible teaches and take a hard stance on what the Word of God says. I'm sick and tired of people not wanting to take stances on things. It's real, real irritating. Good people sometimes, you can tell you know the truth. You understand the truth. I've had conversations with you about this and I can see that you understand it. You've told me that you believe in incarnational sonship and people are just afraid to say it. They're afraid to preach it. Preachers all over the United States, they're afraid to talk about the Trinity. Or they're so stupid and so ignorant they don't understand anything about the Godhead or the Trinity. This has been a... It's just... You know, the, the doctrines of the Trinity and the Godhead and the Sonship of Christ are so just discombobulated, it's ridiculous. So, this is something that needs to be preached repeatedly. This is something, somebody needs to stand up and take the bull by the horn, seriously. And people need to start preaching about this and you need to start teaching people this when you have the opportunity. This is a, a often misunderstood truth, a even almost lost truth in a lot of ways to Baptists. The sonship of Christ is not a difficult subject. He became a man. How hard is that to understand? A son has a birth, fool. There's a time when a son was begotten. This is not difficult to understand. The Bible says that the Word was made flesh. The Bible says, Thou art my son, now let me talk about my, your sonship. This day have I begotten thee. Sons are begotten. There was a time. Brother Rick, how many sons do you have? Four. Was there a day when they were begotten? Yeah. Is it that hard or that difficult? They're attached to each other. A son is begotten. These two things come together. That's why he says, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten me. My son. That's what he's saying. This is super simple. It's not difficult. You know, people and in... in, in this needs to be cleared up and then people need to stand up and preach it. People need to teach this. When you're out soul winning and you have an opportunity, teach it to people. Amen. Obviously get them saved, but then afterwards take some time and teach them you know, about the sonship of Christ. About to have some questions about the Trinity. I have people ask me that all the time because people are so stinking confused about the Trinity and about the Godhead. You know, you know what it does is it brings glory to the Lord Jesus Christ when people start understanding it. Amen. Oh, the Son of God is God in the flesh? Okay. Yeah, it's the Creator. It's, you know, the Almighty, the Alpha and the Omega became flesh. It brings glory to God. And it's so easy to understand that He was made flesh. He was begotten in a day. Look at this. Let's look at this now. Verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, He also likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Now notice that he had to take part in order to die. Do you understand that? He had to take part in order to die. He couldn't have died unless he took part. Do you know what that means? There had to be a change that took place. For him to put on flesh, that means he didn't have it before. So that he could die. That through death is what it's saying. Look at, verse, look at the next verse, verse number 15. And deliver them who, who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Watch this. For verily he took not on him. Now notice that language. He took not on him. To take something on means what? He didn't have it before. There has to be a moment when you put it on. That's what it means to take on. He took not on him the nature of angels... But he took on him the seed of Abraham. So he took it on him. It's like saying he put it on. Yeah, but he always had it on. You're an idiot. You're a liar is what you are. You don't, I don't believe that the people that have been pressed and, and put in the corner and they've seen these verses and they've heard them repeated, I don't believe that you really think the Bible teaches this. I don't buy it. You're a liar. He took not on him the, the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. It, can that be any clearer that there was a time when he put it on or he took it on? I mean, it's as clear as day. The Word was made flesh the day that he was begotten. Look at what it says next. Wherefore in all things it behoved him, watch this, to be what? Made like unto his brethren. What does that mean that he was made like unto his brethren? 
Yeah, but he was always made like unto his brethren. It's, you know what? It makes the Bible sound stupid. That's what it does. It makes no sense. This verse now makes no sense. If he was always, you know, like his brethren, then he was never made like unto his brethren. That doesn't make any sense. You know, words matter, okay? So when the Word was made flesh, there was a time in which God intervened and He caused the Word to become flesh. Became flesh. You know, I mean, this is a simple subject. We need to make sure people understand this. The Sonship of Christ is referring to the humanity of Christ. That's what it's speaking about. You know, if we look at the man Christ Jesus, He was 100% God because God was His Father. And he was 100% man because Mary was his mother. When did that take place? This is obviously he who came from the womb of Mary. When did that take place? At conception. At conception. The Word was made flesh. He took on him, in this case, he took on him the, the seed of Abraham. The seed of Abraham. The Word was made flesh. It says, He was made like unto His brethren. There was a time when He became a man. This is important. Extremely important. You know, there are, you know we, don't take that for granted. This, this, the, this is an important truth. Because it, it, if you don't understand the Sonship of Christ, it jacks you up on so many other things. The, all this stuff ties together, understanding. The Bible is so intricate, and, it's, and, and when the deeper you get in doctrine, it can become complicated. And if you start moving one thing out of the way, you get one thing jacked up, it'll mess something else up. Some other related doctrine when it gets to the Trinity or the Godhead or whatever it may be. So this is, an, this is very important that we need to understand this. Think about this. Hebrews chapter number 1, chapter number 2, like I said, is expressing that totem pole. And notice how closely tied it is when it's talking about man, angel, son of God. And right now it's talking about how he became or took on the humanity. If you misunderstand this process, you're not going to have a full understanding on how he humbled himself and became a man. See, even think about that passage, Philippians chapter number 2, that people misunderstand so much. When they talk about him humbling himself from Philippians 2, everyone know what I'm talking about, that, that verse? Wouldn't, doesn't everyone believe that that's referring to him becoming a man? These, these are even Orthodox Trinitarians, and they believe that there was a time in which he became... Everyone. The foolishness to say that he's always flesh, he's always, you know, he's always been a man, as in a part of mankind, is stupidity, it's ridiculous, it's dumb... It's amateur, and the only person that would believe that is a liar. Anyone who studies the Bible would never come to that conclusion. And I don't, I don't buy that people that know the Bible believe that. So it says that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. To make reconciliation for the sins of the people. He, so he's a faithful high priest, right? He's a merciful and faithful high priest. How is he our high priest? Uh, Think about John chapter number 17. You know, there he's praying. What is he doing? Obviously, he's a man. He is the mediator. The high priest, a priest is a mediator, right? He is the only true mediator between God and man. Why is that? Because he's the, you know, for a lack of a better word, God-man, right? He is God as a man. That's why, that's why it's worded the same way here. It says that... Uh, he was made like unto his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. So notice he had to be made like unto his brethren to be a high priest. Because he had to take on flesh in order to be a mediator. Or he had, he didn't have that ability to mediate between God and man before he came, became a man. Do you understand what I'm saying? He needed, to, he needed to be able to reconcile that gap. Right? To be in between man and God. Just like he needed to take on flesh in order to die. So there's the two things that he was able to achieve by becoming a man. He's able to be our high priest. And he was able to, you know, uh, uh, to condemn sin in the, in the flesh. So it says at the end there, verse number 17, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Verse number 18, for in that he himself hath suffered, being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Succor means to help. That's what that means. Uh, so notice it says, 
For, that means because. It's talking about in the context of him being our high priest. For in that, he himself hath suffered. So because he suffered himself, he went through trials, he went through hard times. Think of the Garden of Gethsemane. Being tempted, he is able to succor, or as I said, help them that are tempted. So by him becoming flesh, by him being made a man, by taking on the seed of Abraham, by taking on flesh, he could then relate unto us and what it felt like or what it feels like in order to be tempted. What it feels like in order to, you know, uh, uh, go through any sort of sufferings. You know, and, and, and this is the perfect conclusion if you think of, uh, you know, this chapter of, of speaking about the humanity of Christ. If you think about, you know, uh, the greatness of our God becoming a man. And thinking about how, how we are able when we pray to Him. We forget about this sometimes. How He relates to what you're saying. Sometimes in prayer you'll forget. And you'll just be praying to Him. And you'll be thinking about your problems. And how you're going through something that is so hard. For as much then as we, right, are partakers of flesh and blood. He also Himself likewise took part of the same. Think about that. So in the same way that, that you are a partaker of flesh and blood, he was as well. The things that you experience in life, he experienced experience them to their fullest as well. To the same degree and in the same way that you experience them. Pain. He experienced pain just like you experienced pain. He experienced heartache just like you experienced heartache. He experienced sorrow just like you experienced sorrow. Amen. He experienced weariness. What it feels like to be tired. He experienced all of these things. He knows what it's like. So when you go to pray to Him, because He became a man, because He wasn't... See how this is important? He wasn't eternally a man. He took part of that. He took part of that flesh and He lived on this earth as a man in a real genuine way. Because He did, he did that for us, when we go to Him in prayer... He's the perfect high priest. It made him perfect through those sufferings. He was complete in order to be our high priest because of the sufferings. Because now, because of that, he can relate to me when I pray to him. If I'm going through something hard in my life, he knows exactly what it's like. He, it doesn't matter what kind of problem or issue that you're having in life. Christ can relate to it. Real problems of mankind. Christ can relate to it. Being tempted, he knows what that's like. He knows these things. So keep in mind when you go to prayer, and that's important. You should be praying obviously daily. Keep in mind when you go to prayer to God, you go in prayer to God, and you're praying to the Lord about something maybe that's bothering you and you need help with something. Keep in mind that you're not talking to somebody who doesn't understand. You're not praying to God and He's just like, you know, that must stink. You know, He knows what it's like. He knows exactly what it's like in its fullness. That's why it's important for as much then as talking about us, that we're partakers of flesh and blood, He also Himself likewise took part of the same, in the same exact way. So when, when you're going through sufferings, pray to God and keep in mind that you're praying to somebody who, who suffered just like you're suffering. And He can relate to you. You know what? It helps Him be... Not only just understanding in that sense, but it helps them be that much more compassionate. Because you know when you have a problem in your life and then you hear about somebody else going through it, I'll give you an example. Back pain. I've never had any serious back pain until last year. Like, I had a little bit, but two years ago I guess it was. But I was like laid up with back pain. And I heard people talk about like real back pain. And I was, I couldn't relate to it. I was just like, man, that stinks. I'm sure that's bad. You know, I'm trying to think of things that I had that's bad. You know what I mean? I'm thinking, you're a stinking wuss, Brother Halt. No, I'm just kidding. You know, I'm not thinking. I'm thinking, you know, I can't really relate to it. You know, that stinks. I mean, I'm, you know, I see people that are like immobile, that are walking around, and you can't fully relate to it. But when I had some serious back pain, I'm serious, like bad, where I couldn't like move, I couldn't roll over for a couple days. It was horrible. And then I hear somebody else talking about, man, I, had, I injured my back bad. It catches my attention. I'm like, oh, man, that's terrible. Anybody who has, has had bad back pain knows exactly what I'm talking about. Don't you, Brother Hall? Brother Rick knows too. You know exactly what I'm talking about. It's, it's like, it is like 
it's horrible. I can't even express to you how bad a back injury is. It's the worst pain anything I've ever went through because you're, you know, it completely demobilizes you, you know. Now I can have compassion on other people that have had that injury because I have in, the, in, a, in a different way, you know, in a full sense, right? Because I could have already related to some injuries, but that way I can, in a, in a complete way, the same thing, the same situation is with Christ. He actually knows what it's like and has experienced the same exact things you're going through. And it made him complete, made him perfect through those sufferings to be the captain of our salvation. So remember that when you go in prayer that he can relate to you. He's not estranged from those things. He knows what's going on. Let's uh, bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for uh, everything that you went through for us. We thank you that, that you are our high priest. Uh, we thank you for, for being the author and the finisher, dear Lord, being the captain, somebody that we can trust in, dear Lord. We thank you for humbling yourself and giving us such a great example, dear God, and, and, and uh, being able to relate to us as brethren. Uh, help us to, to, because of the grace that you showed us, help us to, to uh, uh, show that grace to other people, to preach the gospel, to care for others the way that we should to care for the lost and dying world. Give us an understanding of your word. Thank you for the book of Hebrews. Keep uh, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, the fire burning in our hearts for the word of God. Help us to continually read it and study it and learn from it. And uh, we ask you, you would help us to stand for the truths of, of your word. And uh, we ask you that you would uh, give us, give us uh, uh, courage and uh, bravery, dear Lord. And help us to, to be steadfast in all these areas. And uh, be with us and bless us. Keep our, our, our church uh, zealous for you, dear Lord. We love you. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen.